chapter 5. Coming to the end here soon. Look at James chapter 5, verses uh, 7 through 9 today. He says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband then waited for the precious fruit of the earth, and had long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Here James really uses the situation that they are in. We looked at last week, the first six verses, as believers were going through some trying times. Well, I think we can all uh, measure up to that, right? Nobody goes through this life without some trying times. And so now, it was not only the trying times that they were going through, but also their reaction to the situations that they found themselves in. And that really, in many cases, proves who we are uh, internally as we react and respond to the situations of life. And so that's what James is speaking to in this passage of Scripture. He really looks at our inner self, our inner man, and how we respond to the various situations that we face in life. Jesus stresses the inner man addressing the mind and our emotions. Really, right down to the core of our being, he, he addresses everyday life and where he lives, where we live. And really, when we've seen that, James is a very practical book. He addresses everyday life. He addresses right where we live. This is where we live each and every day. And here are some practical instructions for the difficulties that we might face in life. As we enter the book of Exodus, we see that the children of Israel were in bondage. They were there we, uh, for some 430 years. It came to the point where God was going to deliver them from that land of bondage. He was actually going to use Moses to do that. They found themselves in hard labor and oppression by Pharaoh, actually building his treasured cities. And we see that they cry out to God. And in their cry to God, we see that God responds to their cry. We see that many times in the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms, we see uh, the authors, most of which are David, crying out to God. In their situation, their circumstance, their distresses of life, whatever, the, whatever they may be facing, they cry out to God, and usually you see within the psalm a turn of events, and all of a sudden, maybe where they didn't see God working, or they didn't see God active in a situation, or they didn't see the deliverance that they were desiring, usually by the end of the psalm, you see the thing that is turned around, there is new hope built within that individual, and they're turning to God for an answer and solution, really trusting God. And so we see that the same events are taking place as they are in heavy bondage. God provides, God is going to provide a way for their escape. He already has a plan in place. He has a way for their deliverance. He sends his servant Moses, and we see that after 10 plagues, finally, Pharaoh is convinced to let the people go. What is the, what is the, the straw that breaks the camel's back? It is the death of all the firstborn. As we see, really, the Passover, the children of Israel placed, uh, killed a lamb, put the blood of that lamb upon the doorpost of their house, the death angel passes over those houses where the blood is applied. The rest of Egypt suffers the loss of all firstborn. And finally, after 10 plagues, Pharaoh is convinced to let the people go. And yet we see with God there are no limitations in his working. We see in our own life that the Bible says there has no temptation or trial taken you but such as is common to man. 
But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted or tested above that which you're able. Just the fact that God is in control of the events of our life, he is not allowing anything into our life that is beyond our ability to handle, because he gives us the grace and strength to do it. That verse tells us also that God is a faithful God. He says that he is faithful not only to be with us, but he is faithful to deliver us as well. And so we see that God has many times the answer that we need on the way. James addresses the reaction to those that are going to, through trying times. How are these events going to affect their own personal life? That's what it's all about. The events that we go through in life affect our own personal life. What is our personal life? What is our development in the process of the various things that we go through? Really, as we look at the fact that we go through adversity in life, we face situations that are not pleasant. Nobody wakes up one day and says, <laughs> hey, shower the trouble on me, right? We try to avoid the showers and the difficulties and take roads to avoid certain things in life. And there's no way that many times we can avoid things that we face in life. But what is the ultimate purpose that God has? It is really our development. He calls it our spiritual growth or sanctification. He tells us, Paul tells us, that we know that all things are working together for good to them that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of Christ. So what is God's ultimate goal? Is that we would be conformed to the image of Christ, that we would be Christ-like. He says that God is using a process in working all things together for our good. In that verse, we have a present tense verb, which means God is continually working things together for our good, continuous action. He is using all the events that we may encounter in life for our good. Well, we don't see that many times. We don't look at the positive that might come out of a situation. Really, we look and focus most of all on the negative things of life. And yet, as we factor God into the negative, there comes some positive out of the negative. Because in God's working, in God's providence, he is able to do things that we could never imagine or things that we could never do for ourselves. And that would, that's what James is speaking about. It's our personal progress in the Christian life. And so not, it's not the first time he addresses our development in the Christian life. Chapter 1 starts out with, uh, Let patience have its perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. And so really, as he begins this book, he says, Count it all joy when ye fall into diverse trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. The idea of perfect and entire is a complete a completeness. And really, in that context, he talks about our maturity. Let patience have its perfect work. What is patience? Well, you know, being able to stop for a red light, that's patience. When you want to go through it, right? <laughs> no, that's more than patience. If, that, if, that, if that's all patients had to do with, then uh, sooner or later we, the light would go on and we wouldn't be so upset by stopping for the next red light. But patience has the idea of endurance. The situations that we find in life that we'd love to escape from. Those things which we do not desire to be in our life, and yet we want a way of escape. People are looking for ways of escape all the time. And patience has the idea of remaining under. Here's the circumstance that you're in, and we are to remain under that circumstance until God provides an answer, solution, or deliverance. So the, the idea of patience is to be steadfast, not to give in, to endure, which again, not always easy, but there is a process in which God is leading us through 
And that process is called spiritual <coughs> development, spiritual growth. And so what is the end result that we might be full grown or mature? In these six verses, we see, the first six verses, we see that believers here are going through some very trying times in their life. First, I think it was verse six that leaves us with the fact that some were even losing their life. And so now they were actually laying down their life to the point of injustice. We see the person that they work for not only oppressed them, but kept back their wages. We saw last week that there is always power in those that oppress people. They're rich or powerful. They have the power and resources to behind them many times to oppress people and keep them under. And yet God here says that they're going to cry out to the Lord. When they cry out to the Lord, he talks about that, I just read that in the Old Testament. He says, you guys better be careful if you mistreat the widow and the orphan. Because if they cry out to me, <laughs> you're in trouble. Basically, that's everyday life. Things are all right. You better, not, you better not rock the boat when it comes to oppressing the widow and the orphan and the stranger. Because if they cry out to me, well, we can do the same thing, right? In our situation, in our difficulties, what do we do? Where do we take our situation? Where do we take our problems? Ultimately, it's you and God through all life. I mean, sometimes we look at, well, we got this person, a family member, a friend, or, but when it comes down to life, your journey really is you and God. Well, that's a good partner to go through life with because he's promised never to leave you nor forsake you. He's promised to be with you all the days of your life. He's promised to be a faithful guide and friend. And we see in various portions of scripture that Jesus says, I don't even call you servants no more. I call you my friend. And you know what? The Bible talks about in the book of Proverbs. There's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And so now we have a relationship with God, a friendship with God. And in that relationship and friendship with God, we have a resource. We can go, what limitations are there with God? Are there any limitations whatsoever? He says that there's nothing too hard or impossible with God. He says, for with me, all things are possible. And so now with God, who is God? Well, he's the creator, maker of the universe. He is the all-powerful God of heaven, the all-knowing God, the all-wise God, the all-present God. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present in the universe at the very same time. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. Where's the limitations? See, there are no limitations when it comes to the resources that we have as we are linked to the all powerful God of the universe. And so really, we see that he mentions not only their development, but their reactions as well. Life circumstances, many times, that's where we fail, in life circumstances. And it's, it's the situations that we find ourselves in now is really determined how much progress we've made in life. Because the circumstances really many times bring out who we are. There we find our reactions, our responses to life. Again, we've used the illustration of the tea bag. What kind of tea is in the bag? Well, there's hundreds of different kinds of tea. Uh, maybe you got a good nose and you can sniff out what kind of tea is in that bag. But really, what really shows what's in the bag, I could have 10 tea bags here, hang them up, and guess what? You wouldn't know what was in that tea bag until it hits, what, the hot water. And that's what life is. We don't know what we truly are inside until we face the difficulties of life, the hot water situations, and then what is in actually comes out. Our reactions to life, our responses to life, our responses to the hard situations in life. And so, again, we see that that is a part of life. We see uh, it's hard uh, many times, again, to control those things in life because normally we react to the situations of life. 
I mean, we are good reactors, right? <laughs> I mean, how many times did someone, someone push our buttons? Do you react or do you let it go, right? Many times we're so trained in reacting that it comes automatically. I mean, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, a good reaction is what? Road rage, right? <laughs> somebody else reacting to somebody else, right? When maybe they should say, hey, whatever, let the guy go. I'll never see this guy again. But all of a sudden, there's something that starts your blood boiling. And all of a sudden, you see, you've seen it in roads. I mean, this guy's chasing down this guy on the expressway and tailing him or some other situation. But it's reactions. How do we react to the circumstances in life? And so we've already trained ourselves to react. And usually the reaction mode is not, is not that great, okay? I mean, many times we can see reactions in living color. We know what it is to respond, react, maybe lose our cool, uh, be uncontrolled. And so not only is it hard to control our reactions, Many times it's hard to keep tongue in cheek, right? <laughs> now all of a sudden when we react, guess what? Some words start flowing. And all of a sudden as those words begin to flow and it's like uh, we find ourselves going down another road of reacting to the circumstances in life. So not only does he picture in the six, first six verses the fact that these people are going through difficulty, that is not the main uh, just of the teaching here. The teaching is when you're going through the circumstances of life, how are you going to respond? How are you going to react? Are you going to allow those events <coughs> in life to bring about maturity in your Christian life? And so as we look at this, these verses that we read this morning, we see that he, first of all, it, the exhortation to patience, he gives an illustration of patience, and then he gives the application of patience. Again, James is very practical in his teaching, and so he, first of all, in this passage of Scripture, he, we have the exhortation to patience. It's found in verse 7. Be patient, therefore. So now, wherever you have a therefore, it always goes to the preceding context. He goes through the difficulties of their life. He goes, go to now, you rich. We, we, go, we looked at last, your riches shall be corrupted, so on. He says in verse 4, behold the hire of your labor. Some of the you have hired uh, have reaped down your fields, which ye have kept back by fraud. So you, someone has done work for you, and you've not paid them. He says, cries and the cries of them and have, uh, which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and he goes on. But anyway, we see that this therefore refers back to the circumstance that they find themselves in. And, and really, what is the backdrop of all that he's talking about in this passage of scripture? He's really in the background of, background of going through difficulties, he uses the fact that Christ is coming again. Christ is coming again. So he encourages the believers, though they are going through difficulties in their life, that Christ is coming again. And when Christ comes again, what's going to happen? First of all, it, it terminates all our difficulties. The moment Christ comes, Comes, we're caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air. What does that do? It's the end of your earthly difficulties. And so now he holds this before the believers as an encouragement, that the fact that Christ is returning again. I mean, does the Bible speak to the fact that Christ is returning again? Well, remember when Jesus went up, into the clouds, the angels that stood there, the disciples that were there, the angels saying, this same Jesus shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go. He says, why gaze ye up into heaven? Christ is going to return again in like manner. We see that in the rest of the teaching of the Bible, that Christ is coming again, 
Revelation 19, he's going to return on a white horse. But there's something in between that happens. One day, God takes all the believers from the face of the earth. When does that happen? It's called the rapture of the believer of the church. He says, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's a day, it says, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, as the twinkling of an eye, as fast as you can blink your eye, it's going to happen. Millions of people are going to disappear. They're going to be caught up together with that, with, with, uh, with other believers to meet the Lord in the air. So now, what is, what is James doing? In the difficulties that they face in life, he is holding this as, as, as an encouragement, the hope that, hey, your difficulties are going on now, but the hope is that at any moment, these difficulties could come to an end at Christ's return. So he says, be patient, therefore. We see the exhortation here of what? What is, what is the patient? Actually, it refers to a different patience than chapter 1. Here the patience is to be long-tempered or con contrast to short-tempered. Well, we've heard it said before of an individual, maybe. He has a short fuse. <laughs> you ever meet anyone with a short fuse? Well, so here the patience that he's referring to is being long-tempered. The next thing is short-tempered, okay? So how many people here are on the side of being short-tempered? <laughs> uh, how many people have the patience of being long-tempered? I mean, when someone's pushing your button and they're agitating, agitating you, are you short-tempered or quick-tempered? Well, what are we, okay? It's our response to the events of life. So when he says, be therefore patient, he's talking about individuals who are going through difficulty, and the exhortation is to be long-tempered, to let the, let, the, let the fuse burn a little bit instead of uh, having that short view, fuse and we respond to the different things that we encounter. Uh, basically, we know what that looks like. I mean, we've seen it before. Uh, we could use a, an illustration today. Does anyone want to volunteer? <laughs> uh, it works better if you have a husband and wife, so then we can watch this thing go on, uh, develop, right? Right in front of our eyes. I mean, are we always short-tempered? Are we always long-tempered? Uh, it seems like many of the events in life, the stresses of life, did you notice when COVID came, people really had short uh, fuses? <laughs> they drove different. They responded different. People weren't driving the same. I mean, there's just that event. People were, were they were uh, stressed out. And you saw that there was different reactions in people's uh, patience and being able to endure. And so we know what it's like. We've been there. We've responded to those situations in life. And again, here we see that believers are going through difficulty in their life. That's always the back, backdrop of, I mean, when, when things are going, going all right, things are pretty settled, I mean, then do, do you have a problem with being short-tempered or long-tempered? No, it's the event that comes into your life that really ignites the situation. And so now these believers, the whole book of 1 Peter talks about Believers who are going through difficulty in their life. He says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, uh, uh, 12, he says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. So Peter says you're going through difficulty. He says, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trials which are to try you. There is everything inside of us, really, when those situations arise in life, especially when people take advantage of us, there's everything inside of us that calls out for revenge, to get even, to even the score. It's, at, it's attitude of self, uh, 
It is an attitude of self-restraint that enables us to refrain from hasty ret retaliation when we face provocation. We've seen it all the time. Do people have control? Well, don't let someone into the lane. You'll see if they have control or not, okay? Drive down the road. You'll see if people have control or not. Look at our own life and we'll see if we have control or not, right? Are we in control or do we allow the circumstances and situations dictate the way that we respond? Well, there's many things in the book of Proverbs that addresses these issues of life. Remember, Proverbs is written by the man Solomon, the wisest man that ever walked on the face of the earth beside Christ. Well, he writes uh, 3,000 Proverbs. Can you imagine that? 3,000 Proverbs, 1,005 songs. We have one song recorded of Solomon, the, so the Song of Solomon. And we have in the book of Proverbs, we don't have 3,000 Proverbs of Solomon. We have about 300. We have about one-tenth of what he actually uh, set forth in his Proverbs. Well, here's one of the Proverbs of Solomon. He says, he, notice what he says here, he that is slow to anger, okay? Are you slow to anger? He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. So you can conquer a whole city, and he says, yet you can be defeated in your own life by not controlling your own spirit. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth, what do you rule? You master yourself. He that ruleth his spirit is, is better than he that taketh a city. Proverbs 25, 28 says, he that has no rule, he that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without wall. If you have no rule over your own spirit, your responses in life, he says you are like a city that is broken down and without walls. Well, what is the significance of walls around the city? They built them for a reason. It's safety, right? So the walls were built to keep people inside safe, right? The security was within the walls. And yet, he says, if you cannot control yourself, you're like a city that is destroyed and without walls. That means you are defenseless. In every situation, you're not controlling yourself. You're constantly reacting and responding to all the circumstances and situations of life. Now you've trained yourself to do it so that every situation and every circumstance of life, you know what it does to you? It agitates the crap out of you. And you're ready to, you got your, you got your dukes up and you're ready to fight it out, right? So now, how, what, how, what kind of person are you? Well, you're the person that uh, is, is going through life, you know? How are you going through life, <laughs> you know? Come on, you know, stand down or else, okay? No, that's not how to live life, okay? Now you got the Christian part of it, and that's not the, I don't know if that's too Christian, right? <laughs> Having a fist fight out in the parking lot at some grocery store, I don't know. Uh, and then tell, ask them if they want to come to church on Sunday. <laughs> oh, do you know Jesus as you're slugging it out there with someone else? And so he's, he's not talking, he's talking about, hey, this is, this is our life, this is who we are. And he talks about long suffering. Someone says it, it's long suffering is the virtue that is not, does not flourish readily in the heart of the natural man. Long suffering is not something we come equipped with, with right? We come equipped with a short, short fuse. And so again, he says long suffering it is the virtue that does not flourish readily in the heart of the nature of man. It is called, someone has called it a, uh, a commendable virtue among men. If you have the ability to be long-suffering, it's a commendable, commendable virtue among men. How long are, are we to exercise this patience? question, how long? <laughs> how long can you endure, right? 
He says, be patient, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. So according to that verse, how long are you to exercise patience? No, he tells you how long. I just read it. We, is everyone awake here this morning? <laughs> I'm going to give you the zap button. Right. How long? He said, be patient. How long? Unto the coming of the Lord. Okay, so unto the coming of the Lord, what is the end? When is Christ coming? We don't know. So how long do you have to be patient? Until the end, right? Until he comes. Because when he comes, guess what? All your difficulties in life are terminated, right? So how long are you to be patient, to suffer long, that, to, to add a little bit to your week, uh, wick, until the coming of the Lord, okay? So that's what he sets forth here. Until the coming of the Lord, we are to be patient. The word describes an attitude of, of uh, uh, an attitude which can endure delay and bear suffering and never give in, okay? To bear suffering and never give in. Our dealings with people, many times they're heated up, many times that heat rages and we are to control ourselves. We are to keep ourselves under control. We are to keep working towards the goal, which is Christ-likeness, right? So now, hey, what is the example of being long-suffering? I mean, we need an example here. What is the example? What do you, what do you think the example of being long-suffering is? If there's a perfect example that we could turn to in life of a person that was actually long-suffering, he's a person that en endured opposition, uh, all kinds of things against him, and yet in that opposition, never retaliated, never got even, uh, never spoke a curse word, never said, I'm going to get you. I mean, who is the perfect example in being long-suffering? Christ. Christ, right? So now he, set, he, he sets forth, Peter sets this forth as our example. Look at, well, I'll, I'll read it. First uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 20. He says, For what glory is it, it when ye are buffeted for your fault, so someone, hey, if you're at work and your boss tells you you're screwed up, and, you're, and, and you take that correction. He says, for what glory is it when, if ye are buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently, okay? You don't react when the boss says hey, you screwed up and whatever, you just take it patiently. But he says, but if when ye do well, so now you're doing good, ye suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. So now you've done nothing wrong and someone's getting on your case and then he says, now you, you take it patiently. Then he goes on, for even hereunto were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow. So here's the example, Christ, that we should follow, who did no sin. Because many times in our reaction to suffering and our response is what are we actually doing? We're sinning. Because there's something we're doing, we're cursing, doing something that's uh, causing us to sin. So it says of Christ, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth right, righteously. So really, he committed his case to God who in his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we're healed. For ye were sheep going astray, but now you returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your, of, 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 of your souls. And so we see that uh, Christ, he uses the illustration of the fact that Christ is coming again. What does he mean when Christ is coming again? The idea of coming means to be alongside of, close to, to be, the word he uses an I mean ver, ver, uh, verb, which means to, uh, it's unchanging, okay? It's in, it's in the state of being, what, close to God. Alongside of, in his presence. 
unto the coming of the Lord we are to be patient until we are alongside in the presence of God. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also, in the very presence of God. Then we have the second thing. We have an illustration that he gives of the farmer. The farmer, the husband, then he exercises long patience over the harvest. I mean, you look at the farmer, he does what he has to do, but when he's done doing what he has to do, everything else is in the hands of God. He, the weather, uh, hail, we've had hail at our house now the fourth time already in, in about three or four days. But all those things can destroy your harvest, right? No rain or too much rain or whatever the situation may be. And yet now he goes out, the husband then, he exercises this patience. He does what he's supposed to do. He, first thing, so the illustration of the husband then, he uh, tills his soil, he sows his fields, he looks forward to the harvest, the growth and development of that harvest to receive, he says, the precious fruit of the earth, which means uh, received, means precious, valuable fruit of the harvest. He waits looking expectant, expectantly until really the end process takes place and he can bring in his harvest. Yes, uh, again, we see his own personal activity, his own, we see, uh, yeah, but we see again, in, in, uh, in the situation of a farmer, we see uh, independent uh, uh, independence upon he's de uh, he is okay let me just try this again he is dependent on forces outside himself that he cannot control hey that's the same thing we do there's forces outside of ourselves that we cannot control one of the things we want to do in life is we always want to do what we want to control the circumstances. And when we can no longer control the circumstances, if it's not something that we can take into our hand, then life becomes a little more complicated. And yet, as you look at the farmer, there's no circumstance under his control. So he has to release the circumstances of life without being in control of anything. He's done his part. He's sown the... He's sown the uh, the seed, he's uh, done, tilled the ground, he's put it in. Everything now is out of his control. There is not one thing that is under his control now. All he has to do is he has long patience waiting for what? The process of the development of the seed to bring it to maturity. Uh, he has long patience over it as a continuous action. It's, it's a continuous thing. Over it, he deals with the mental and emotional concerns which are which focus on it. So, what is it? What is what is affecting him? Do you think there's any effect on him uh, emotionally and uh, intellectually as he waits over the harvest? It has the emo an idea of a mental and emotional concern. I mean, the farmer and my relatives were farmers. They go out there and measure a tenth of of an inch of water. Oh wow, we have a tenth of an inch or two tenths or three tenths. And you know what? They get excited when they get a little rain or it rained here and it didn't rain there. Well, there's an emotional connection and there's, there's uh, not only emotional but mental connection as well. We go through the same things in the difficulty of life. There is mental, we're, we are expending energy all the time thinking about the various things that we're do, going through, right? We're mulling them over in our minds. So some points, mentally and emotionally, can wear you out more than a 40-hour week, right? Sitting at a, work, uh, at a job. Because it works on you mentally and emotionally. Well, what is it that God is calling us to do in this process? We have to trust God, right? Just like the farmer has to trust God, he waits, he says, for the early and red later rains. The first rain arrives in October and November, softens the hardened ground that has been baked by the sun. 
Then there's the, the planting and the sowing. The bulk of the rain comes through in that area, December through February in the middle of Israel. Then he waits for the latter rain in April, May to finish off the harvest so that he can bring it in. And so now he says this is the process in all this, this pro process, he is to be dependent so solely on God. Uh, again, everything is in the hands of the God in the hands of God. So now what does he say? He says in James chapter 5, he says, uh, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman or farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he received the latter and early rain. Now we have the application, be ye also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord, draw it nigh. The application of this patience, be ye patient, applies this to everyday life so in like manner. Just like the farmer is patient over the crop, so are we to be patient as well. In your trying circumstances of life, exercise patience. Let it develop in your life. How? Just like the farmer does. Then he goes on and gives two commandments, three commandments actually. First of all, stresses that they, uh, like the farmer, have a specific need for patience. What is our greatest need? In this verse, he says, we have a need of patience. He says, amid their experiences of oppression and injustice, which makes it a little harder when you're going through things that you don't want to go through, uh, then all of a sudden he says, well, let this patience thing kick in in your life. They were to develop this response, an attitude of long-suffering forbearance as they wait for the Lord. That is the first thing he calls them to do. So the first thing is be ye also patient. The next imperative is establish your hearts. Establish your hearts urges them to strengthen and make firm their inner life. That's where we at, that's where we live. It's not the external, it's who we are inside. And so now, what is James telling these people to do? He's telling them to make strong or make firm their inner life. They are to stand firm and unmovable. Instead of the feeling of agitation and uh, being shaken up by their experience of oppression, they are to develop the inner sense of stability. They are to be stable inside. Not falling apart, but inside they are to be stable. Is that something that God develops in our life? He says in chapter 5, uh, of verse 10 of Peter, he says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after he hath suffered a while, make you perfect, Establish, strengthen, settle you. That's where God wants us to be. He wants us in our suffering to make us perfect, establish us, strengthen us, and settle us. Why? He says, because the, the coming of the Lord draws not. And the last verse says, grudge not one against another. The idea of sighing or groaning pictures their undesirable circumstance or oppression that they are suffering under. The inner feeling of dissatisfaction. How many events of life do we feel dissatisfied about? Now he says, grumble not. Again, he gives another imperative. Giving vent verbally to your trying situations. He is talking about uh, the groanings that we portray and set forth to who? <laughs> When you're going through difficulty, who's, who hears your groanings? <laughs> Wait, who should hear your groanings? Who should hear your grumblings? God. When you're going through difficulty, who hears your groanings? <laughs> well, your husband, your wife, your fellow workers, your neighbors, everybody hears your groaning, right? Because you're ready to unload your, your difficulty to the whole world. And so the imperative is, hey, you know what?
turn it over to God. Uh, the, the songwriter said, take it to the Lord in prayer. Next, under trying circumstances, many times being subject to oppression and injustice, we give way to the, that vexation and unjustly lashing out against others, right? So now we're so agitated that Paul had nothing to do with him, but I'm ready to gobble him up, right? I'm ready to jump down his throat because I'm, now my, my fuse is even shorter, right? Instead of gaining experience from the situation, my, my fuse is even shorter. I like what the songwriter wrote in What a Friend We Have in Jesus. He says, are you weak? Are you weak and heavy laden? Cumbered with a load of care. Do you have a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are you weak? Are you heavy laden? Cumbered with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to where? The Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank, we thank you once again for your grace, your goodness to us. We thank you for the instructions that we have with James to develop uh, long-suffering and patience in our life. Uh, again, we thank you for this instruction, and we pray that you help us to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.